inevitable world, the magnet of our difficult ascent, the sun from which we kindle all our sun, the light that leans from the unrealized vasts, the joy that beckons from the impossible, the might of all that never yet came down. All nature dumbly falls to her alone to heal with her feet the aching throb of life and break the seals on the dim soul of man and kindle her fire in the closed heart of things. All here shall be one day her sweetness home. All contraries prepare her harmony. Towards her our knowledge climbs, our passion gropes. In her miraculous rapture we shall dwell. Her clasp shall turn to ecstasy our pain. Our self shall be one self with all through her. It's a, <clears throat> it's a joy and a privilege to speak on any aspect of Savitri. And it's in a way doubled because it's Dr. Nathkarni's memorial lecture. I remember when few years back, few years must be quite a number of years, I don't really recollect. But it was during one of the camps to Nainital before I had taken premature retirement and I was debating with myself, should I go for these camps or should I not go? He was also there in the same camp. And this debate had been going on for some time during those years because I wanted a very clear answer from the mother that I, am, I should be doing this. It's a very risky territory. I always feel this speaking business is not always a good business. And so, <laughs> Before retirement from the Indian Air Force, I thought, let me take retirement from this speaking part. So I just shared this feeling with him. I actually thought aloud, because I know this answer had to come from inside. This cannot come from anyone outside. But as if um, he foreshadowed the answer that was to come, he said it will be a great loss for the work. That's all he said. So, I was not sure, I was frankly not too convinced about it uh, because I really believe that mother's work carries on in so many ways. Often silence is more powerful than speech. Nevertheless, it has so happened that over the years there was a closeness which developed with Dr. Nath Karni. He came to stay in my house when he came to Bangalore. And it was really such a joy. What simplicity, despite such a great intellect. And I was very touched with uh, some of these moments, precious moments that I spent with him. And then, of course, before uh, the year he, he left, for the lap of the Divine Mother. Few months before, he just happened to mention that could you take the November camp? So I was really nonplussed and I told him, Nath um, it'll be way. anyways you are taking. He said, no, no, I'm not feeling too well. Uh, I've shared this with some people personally, I've never shared it publicly, but since it's Dr. Nath Kani's memory lecture, maybe a few words. So I said, um, he said, I'm not feeling too well. So I said, well, Nathkani, you'll be fine by November. It's, it's uh, I mean, um, people will come to listen to you. He said, let us see. Um, then finally, after much uh, hesitation, I said, all right, um, All India Magazine, they can put my name, but I do hope that you'll be fine and uh, you'll take the lecture. He said, all right. And then the only thing was that I said essays on the Gita and Savitri both will be a bit too much because of the medical work, so uh, I'll take up Savitri. He said, all right. 
And it so happened that I don't remember the exact date when this conversation took place, but maybe a month or at the most two months. Um, it's it's uh, in one way, it, it's a difficult moment for me, but I'm sure everyone will bear with it that I had a call from Miradi and um, I happened to be the first doctor who reached when Dr. Nathkarni left his body. He had already left his body. Uh, right behind uh, Dilibda came and all of us then came together. It was such a swift and sudden event that it seemed almost that, uh, I mean, really it's uh, at one level it's a grace that um, he just, um, he left the body so painlessly, I mean, so swiftly, no suffering, no, uh, no fuss, and it was something remarkable. I have seen so many deaths in my practice, but this is one of the exceptional kinds of departure that I have seen. And if anything is a sign that he was indeed an exceptional person, being, this was one of them. So here we are remembering him on this day, and what better remembrance than to read Savitri, something which he loved and he loved to sing about it. Coming to the theme, um, the journey of love from Savitri. When I think of Savitri, what Savitri is, I am reminded of those lines in Savitri itself because Savitri has everything in it, including what Savitri is. And these lines come at the end of uh, Book 2, Canto 8, when after the descent of night, Ashupati has torn through the veil of darkness. Night has been cleaved and cut asunder. And we have those lines which emerge, the lyric of love that waits through time, the message of the superconscious fire, the book of bliss. This is what Savitri is. It's a lyric of love. If we see in one word, it's a lyric of love. But the amazing part is when Sri speaks about Savitri in the author's note, he mentions an interesting adjective which I have often felt has not received enough attention, conjugal love conquering death. Now, I believe that the great ones in the past, the ancient ones who wrote these beautiful stories, they did happen and um, even apart from that, they were not just writing things symbolically, there was a stark realism in all that they wrote. wrote. It was not just an ethereal possibility, but a very material possibility. And that often hits me hard. I can't say I've fully understood, grasped the full import of what it means, except that it is possible in a human body, in flesh and blood, that love which is hidden in the heart of creation and works silently. It is possible. The truth that it is the age of truth and we all know that Sri has and the mother's tapasya, the great sacrifice, has brought down to earth the supramental truth consciousness. And unfortunately, like all terms, the word truth also evokes in us a certain sense and a meaning. We are so accustomed to truth in terms of science. Science explores truth. What about the heart? Oh, that's mere sentimental emotionalism. I feel if there is one civilizational disease which has been chronic, with which human beings have suffered and continue to suffer, it is the want of love. Both as a practitioner of the path of yoga and uh, both uh, as a psychiatrist, as a doctor. If I look around, having gone around the world, I see that people suffer because of want of love. All education caters to knowledge, knowledge, more and more knowledge. Knowledge for power, 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 mastery. The heart is ignored in the process. It's stifled. The response of heart to truth is lost. We do not even know, we do not even hear its language. It's crushed, it's kept aside. It's not even spoken of. It's bad to speak about it. It's like when people grow up, we are not supposed to cry. To love is almost like <laughs> an anathema to a modern civilized person. 
So this is understandable because love is also the first power that has plunged into creation. And therefore, um, it may be a very funny way to look at it, but it would be the last to emerge. A lot has to be ready for this power to emerge. I'm reminded of a small uh, analogy. Analogy means every, every time experience, because everything in this world is interconnected. So from one event, you can draw the truth of another event, because it's all in a single plan. So I have a habit of reaching early to airports, and I feel comfortable that, you know, I don't have to wait for long. So once somebody told me a very interesting, you know, I always felt this is very logical. Why do you want to rush last minute? He said, no, there is a reason why you should go towards the end. So I asked him why. He said, if you give your baggage in the beginning, it will come out last. So <laughs> I started observing it and I saw it's really true. <laughs> so, but well, uh, old habits die hard and I still prefer to get the baggage last rather than take the chance to miss the flight. So. Something like that has happened that in this creation when all the, we know the great story when being plunged into this darkness. The being plunged is very interesting. Shobindo speaks about it. Not just some kind of bare truth because when we speak about truth, Shobindo brings truth. But it's not the truth of the material scientists. It's not that which is truth. Bare, cold, impersonal, heartless something which can be resolved into a whirling dance of protons and electrons and atomic particles. That's not the truth that Shubhinda brings. It is a truth, one of the truths, but not the truth. Similarly, it's not the truth of the mystic sitting aloof, cut off from all, indifferent to the pain and pangs of this world, sitting on the mountain tops of some inmost recesses or in some cave, inaccessible to world, aloof, in some trance, waiting upon the infinite to merge and be dissolved in that. It's not the truth of these two extremes. He brings a truth that is one with love. A truth which is not one with love will be harsh. It's not that kind of truth that Shurabindu wants to establish on earth. And Mother took particular care to remind us that the Superman, what he will have, that is left to everybody's imaginations. But what he will not have has been very, very clearly said. He will not be a cruel being. He will embody in himself the truth of love, a bliss, a power, a flame-white love, a light, a bliss, a light, a power, a flame-white love, caught all into a soul, immense embrace. Existence found its truth on oneness breast. So this is the truth that has plunged into creation. But to come back to the story, when darkness was there, covered with darkness. So the gods had to go in to rescue all the energies that had gone, deviated from their true purpose, gone out and plunged into the darkness and assumed that shape and color, hidden, wrapped. Where are they? Where are they? None of the gods is daring to leap into it. It's too dark. It's such an immense work. Then Agni, the representative of the divine consciousness and will, says, I will go, but I have one condition. And the condition is, looking at the divine mother, Aditi, Agni says, I see in your heart a most beautiful, resplendent light, shadowless, pure, intense. And if that you give us, like a money, I will come. And if Agni goes, all the other gods will follow. So the Divine Mother poured that light, a drop of that light from her fathomless heart of love and bliss. And that light, that pure shadowless light from her heart has gone into creation and since then it is engaged in the labor of love. It is the love that crystallized itself as the psychic essence. This is what we are told. That it's that drop and following it the gods, Agni, Mitra, Varuna, Bhag, Indra, Som, Ashwins, Ribhus, the artisans of immortality. All these plunged into the darkness. Why? Because they went as the spear point, the flame white love 
from the heart of the Divine Mother. This is the origin of that love. Beings plunge into this darkness to rescue it. It's very interesting when we speak about the Divine. He is not just an impersonal universality. This is very... Um, often now there is a tendency to speak of, yes, every path leads to, <laughs> leads to that reality. And this word reality is a very funny word. There is a scientific reality, there is material reality, there is psychological reality. Reality with a capital R. There is a reality of the Advaitin, there is a reality of the Buddhist, there is a reality of all kind. But the reality which Shurabinda speaks of is not just an impersonal universality, it is a being, it is a transcendent being. And that being has plunged himself into this darkness. This is beautifully mm. brought out in Savitri. Everything is brought out beautifully in Savitri. So it's understood, page one for one, kingdoms of little life. In the enigma of the dark and vast, in the passion and self-loss of the infinite, 